So this Sunday, as we're looking at eschatology, we are looking at the second coming of Christ. Uh, not to be confused with the rapture when we meet Christ in the air, uh, but the second coming of Christ when Christ actually physically comes all the way to this earth. Uh, we read in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. So the question then is, who are we talking about here? We go on to verse 13. And he was clothed with a, vest a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Well, if you remember when John wrote the book of John, John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And this is how John described the Messiah, or how John described Jesus Christ. So that's who's being talked about here in Revelation chapter 19. This is John, just now writing from the island of Patmos. Uh, and he says, look, this is, he is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Uh, so this is how he describes uh, Christ's second coming to the earth. And out of his, um, sorry, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, so the description of Christ coming uh, from glory, coming in glory, is one of a warrior going out to battle. Uh, he's riding on a white horse. Uh, he has this sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, if you are an artist, uh, take whatever medium, pen to paper, or take paints to canvas, uh, paint a picture of this as it's described here. Uh, again, we're going we're gonna to come short of uh, what it actually will be, but when you begin to picture the imagery of this, uh, you, can, you can see the words he's using to describe it. Uh, this is also described in the Old Testament in Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. Zechariah 14, 1 to 5. He says, I behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Uh, so he describes a time when essentially the whole world, uh, or all the nations of the world, will be against Israel. And how Christ will come and he will fight against those nations. We read on in verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So when Christ returns, his foot is going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. That's the location that Christ will return. And when Christ returns, the Mount of Olives is going to split. Uh, and everything is going to change. Uh, uh, the topography, or the, the uh, lay of the landscape, is going to be changed. Where there once was a great mountain, now there's going to be a very great valley. Uh, and the mountain talk, uh, verse 4 talked about the mountain being divided uh, north and south there. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, 
For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel, yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Uh, so again, he's describing Christ's second coming, uh, and how Christ is going to return with the saints, or with believers coming with him. Uh, I do personally believe that will be New Testament saints who have been saved or who have been raptured then out of the earth, uh, who have been with Christ in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb, at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, after that, he will return to earth and he will bring us with him, uh, making up part of this army. Uh, again, some people have a different view on that, but that is my understanding of the scriptures there. When we read on, uh, at the second coming of Christ, Christ is going to come and he is going to occupy the throne of David, uh, or he is going to be set up as king. Uh, and this is part of the reason that when he first came, that many missed it, uh, particularly the Pharisees, because they were looking for a military leader, a military deliverer. They were looking for the coming king, but Christ came as a servant. Uh, and we read in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he set up on the throne of his glory. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33, the promise that was given to Mary when she was uh, about to bring Jesus into the world. Uh, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, or sorry, before, before she had uh, conceived, uh, conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Uh, this is looking back to the Davidic covenant or the promise that God had made to David. Uh, that he would always have a descendant to sit upon the throne over Israel. This was the promise that was made. Well, we know that after David passed away and Solomon stepped onto the scene, uh, and then there were several kings after that, but... Eventually, Israel was taken captive, was hauled off to Babylon, and there was no more king sitting upon David's throne. Thus, when the promise is made to Mary that Jesus would be this king sitting upon this throne, this is looking back to that Davidic covenant, looking back to the promise of the Messiah that he would be the king, and he will rule, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, or he will reign over Israel. Forever. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So this is when Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, as I would probably picture myself just standing there going, you know, he was he was here, and one, he resurrected from the dead, so just automatically being awestruck, and then he walked with them for over 40 days after that, and then he ascended. So he's there with them. Uh, he reinstates or, or gives them the great commission uh, to go and to preach the gospel, and then he's taken up in a cloud before their very eyes, and they just kind of all watch him go up into the clouds, and they're all standing around going, you know, where's he at? What's, what's happening? And God sends these two angels to say, you know, stop, stop staring at the sky. Uh, you've got work to do, essentially, but he's going to come back in the same way that he left. He's going to come out of the sky. That's how it's, it's going to be. Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 30. 
Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Uh, so this is part of Peter preaching at Pentecost, and he's saying, look, this I'm going to tell you about the promise that was made to David, and how this is Christ, who is one day going to return and going to sit upon the throne of David. Uh, that's what Christ is going to do. Uh, he is going to then set up uh, what is known as the millennial kingdom, or the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, I believe this will be a fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. Uh, we read in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 21 to 28, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. So they've been hauled off captive, uh, and God says to Ezekiel, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the children of Israel from all these heathen nations, whether they've been taken captive, and I'm going to bring them back into their own land, uh, a place that will belong to them, a place that was promised to them all the way back uh, with the Abrahamic covenants, uh, where God told Abraham that wherever so uh, his the sole of his foot touched, that land would belong to his descendants. We read on in verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither they, shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Uh, so this is looking back to the time when Israel had been divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, and he says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gather you all and I'm going to reunite you uh, as one nation. Reading on in verse 23, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Uh, so God's making a promise saying, this, this is my peculiar people. This is Israel. This is my nation. Uh, he had chosen them for himself as a means to reveal himself to the whole world. And he says he is going to purify them. He is going to cleanse them. And um, they're going to stop their transgressions. They're going to stop. There's going to be an end of sin. We read on in verse 24, And David my servant shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. He says, so this is a time where they're going to obey. They're going to follow the commands of Scripture. Uh, they're going to walk correctly in his judgments or as he is instructed. They shall dwell in the land that I give, have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Uh, so the promise that David would be a king forever. Uh, well, again, it's not David, exactly David, but it's Christ uh, who is going to be the king forever. Uh, moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Or where he is going to be the central focus of all of Israel. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So there's going to be an eternal sanctuary. There's going to be an eternal place of worship of the one true God. And he says this is, this is how they're going to know. 
Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Uh, when Christ comes and restores the kingdom to Israel, he is going to be uh, reversing what has taken place here. Uh, because Matthew 21, 43, they had rejected Christ as the Messiah, the, the Pharisees had. And he says, look, the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you, and it's going to be given to a nation uh, or given to a people that bring forth the fruits thereof. So this is talking about the time, and, and Romans chapter 11 is going to help us look at that a little bit more, where Israel is temporarily laid aside because of Israel's disobedience, because of Israel's refusal uh, to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Uh, if they had accepted Christ when he came the first time uh, as the Messiah, uh, he would have set up his kingdom then, I believe. But he was rejected. Uh, the, the Pharisees and the, the religious leaders, he presented himself to them. They rejected him. Uh, so then he turned now to everyone else, to the highways and the hedges and uh, to the Gentiles. And Romans chapter 11 talks about that. He says, I say that hath God cast away his people? Uh, that's Paul's question. You know, did, did God, has God totally done away with Israel since Israel rejected and crucified the Messiah? He says, God forbid. He said, no, God is not done with Israel. He says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul says, look, I am, I am a part of Israel uh, because he had their, he's a descendant from them. Uh, again, this is not a promise that goes to every believer, but a promise to anyone who is of Jewish ancestry. Uh, moving on to Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So he says, Israel has rejected the Messiah, and now this, this blindness, Israel is blind to their Savior, blind to their Messiah. And this is going to continue until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. Or until every Gentile believer has come to know Christ as their Savior. He reads on in verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall return away ungodliness from Jacob, or after the time of the Gentiles has been completed, after God has dealt with all the other nations, God is then going to turn back to, and all of Israel will be saved, or all of Israel will be delivered at this point, and he is going to turn them away from ungodliness. Romans chapter 11, verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So Paul is saying, look, the, the Israelites at this point in time, the, the Jewish nation at this point in time, they essentially have made themselves the enemies of Christianity or the enemies of the gospel. Uh, they were against the spread of the gospel. And you, you see, you know, Paul originally uh, was sent out to persecute and to kill Christians. He says, but look, Israel isn't, God isn't done with Israel. Because of election's sake, because God had chosen them uh, as his people, they are still beloved of the Father. And this day is going to come when God is going to redirect his focus upon that nation. Verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, or God does not change. Uh, God chose Israel. God had made unconditional covenants to the nation of Israel, meaning a covenant that God will not take back because God had made a promise. Irregardless of their actions, God said he was going to bless Abraham's seed. 
That's what he had said. He had promised the Messiah. He had made promises to them that they would possess the land. Uh, but he also had made promises, uh, there you can read it in Deuteronomy, how as long as they followed him, they would have the land. But if they stopped following him, stopped obeying him, they would lose out on some of those blessings. But Romans 11, 29, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Or Paul saying essentially, uh, those of us who are Gentiles, uh, we now have the opportunity to believe, uh, and God is more focused with us at this point in time uh, because of Israel's unbelief or Israel's uh, national rejection of the Messiah. That's not saying uh, Jewish people cannot come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, that's not what is, is being said at all, uh, because we see all throughout the New Testament, Paul would first go teach and preach in the synagogue. Uh, he would always go first to the Jew, and then he would go to the Gentile. Uh, that's the way it went. Even so have these also now not believed that through, sorry, through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. Uh, he says, look, they, they still can obtain mercy. They can still come to know Christ as their Savior. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Or this is God's means of providing everyone with the opportunity for salvation, for eternal life. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He goes, God's thoughts are so far beyond ours, we, we can't comprehend. Or if we had planned all of this out, we wouldn't have planned it out this way. But this is the way God has done it. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Uh, again, who, who instructs God on how he should do things? Uh, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Uh, God is the one that we should, and God is the one who we will worship and praise eternally. Uh, the millennial reign of Christ will be a time of peace and harmony. It will be a time of peace and harmony. Isaiah chapter 65 talks about this. Uh, it says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Uh, so this millennial reign of Christ is going to be a time of unprecedented peace. Because the Prince of Peace is going to be ruling upon the throne. Uh, he is going to be reigning. And uh, it's going to be a time of peace, not just in our human terms, but it's also going to be a time of peace even in the animal kingdom, uh, which is just kind of absolutely wild to think about. But God's going to get, yeah, uh, no, no pun intended there. Thank you for catching me on that one. Uh, the animal kingdom, it's wild to think about. Anyway, uh, sorry, that one was free. Uh, but God's going to make it so that there the, literally is, is peace amongst every living thing here upon the earth. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, uh, talks about how at the end of this, uh, Satan is going to be loosed for a short period of time, or after the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So after this thousand-year period, there's going to be a short period of time that Satan is released from his prison. Uh, I understand this is giving those who were born during the millennial reign the opportunity to make a choice. Because those who have lived and those who have been born during the millennial reign or during the thousand-year reign of Christ the only thing they will have known has been peace. The only thing they will have known has been truth and Christ ruling and reigning. 
So as all human beings have to decide what are they going to do with Jesus Christ, God is going to give them the opportunity to make a choice. Even though some will make the wrong choice, he is going to give them the opportunity to make the choice. So at the end of the millennial reign, their Satan is released for a short period of time. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So they're going to, those that uh, Satan tempts away and choose to reject Christ at this point, they're going to make war against God uh, and against God's uh, people one more time. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Uh, so here we see Satan, we see the devil cast into the lake of fire, and hell, for lack of a better term, but the lake of fire, this is a place of eternal punishment. It was created for Satan, it was not created for us. It was not created for humans. Although, if we choose to reject Jesus Christ as our Savior, it will be the place that all those who reject Christ will spend eternity. Scripture is very, very clear on this. Uh, the punishment lasts forever. The good news is God has made a way for us to not have to spend eternity separated from him. The next thing we see in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 is the great white throne judgment. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those book, or sorry, out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So what's written in the books if we look at the end of verse 12? It's the works of every human being, essentially. Uh, essentially, it's a history of the world. And the dead, small and great, are going to be judged out of this. Most importantly, it's going to be judged, what have you done with Jesus Christ? Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to his works. Uh, this is where the whole issue of, uh, well, as long as the good things I do outweigh the bad things I do, God's got to let me into heaven. Uh, the problem is, when is good good enough? Uh, and the problem is, our heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our works are evil. There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, that's the problem here. When our works stand before God's holiness, we fail. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, or this is eternal separation from God for any of those who are not found written in the book of life. That's what Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 and whoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The good news is that God has made a way for us to be forgiven. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life. Anyone who comes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior is offered the opportunity to have their name written in this book of life. They're offered eternity in heaven with God as opposed to what we deserve, which is eternal separation from God in a place called the lake of fire. Christ offers us eternal life. Do you know him today? Have you accepted his free gift of salvation? If you have, you can be confident that your name is written in this book of life. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure that you're saved, then 
this serves as a very strong warning to anyone who does not believe. Because Scripture is clear, anyone who has rejected Christ as their Savior, anyone whose name is not written in that book, is going to be spending eternity separated from God. That's their eternal resting place. But again, the good news is that God offers us salvation. That God offers us eternal life. Uh, and if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's nothing more I would love to do than share with you through God's Word how you can know and how you can be certain that you can have eternal life. Uh, the only thing we have left to cover is eternity. Uh, but, like I said, we'll, we'll cover that in the next uh, not not next week. Uh, next week, yeah, we've got a, we've got forever to cover that one. Um, but that's 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 it. You know, it's it's we either know Christ and we spend eternity in heaven with Him, or we reject Christ's offer of salvation and we spend eternity separated from Him. Uh, we do not have to fear Christ's second coming. For those of us who know Christ as our Savior, this is, this is what we look forward to. We look forward to eternity, worshiping and praising God. Let's pray, and then we'll sing our last song.